morning. This is number six of our sermon series on Christian living. And be before our pastor went for his sabbatical, he gave us and prepared us very well just so our church will continue the series. And the series, when, when I was reading all throughout, First Peter is, is more on the area of us really getting connected this way because this way, this relationship is very hard. And this morning, I'd like to take you to an idea, not mine, I got this from the New Living Translation. And for the whole week, I was trying to really, really go to those words, or the, that word, suffering for doing good. Somehow, it's one of those things, do we really have to suffer if we're going to do something good? 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 22 is our passage this morning. I'd like you to follow along. You have your bulletin. We're going to study well together. And I'd like you to hold on to that word suffering because it's got a bad connotation. But I want you to know when you understand the angle and the places and the spots where 1 Peter is trying to bring us, you will understand why suffering for doing good is good. I like to say and start, suffering for doing good with God is good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that as we intently focused and simply looking at your word, the truth will come out. Nothing of the idea of this guy standing before your people. But the principles that you have laid down in the hearts of the apostles who lived way ahead of us. I pray that that's the same principle that we will gather today in our mind. Just so our mind will start clicking, giving us light so that we will be talking better, we will be moving better, and it will lead us to you closer. That's our intent. Spirit of the living God, be here. Be here. Be here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Suffering for doing good. And as I've said, this is number six. If you want a one-sentence kind of one sentence kind of understanding, here's what I would like you to get. The way to Christ is through the cross of suffering. We know that. But I'd just like to give you a sentence as well. Having a good mindset that doing and staying good, if you want to do something good, if you want to stay good, it's a hard work. It's a hard work. Well, being bad is so easy. Quitting. Lying. It's so easy. But the consequences when you choose good or bad is not a choice of yours. It will be a result of what you have done. And this is something that I'd like you to put in mind. But the question remains, how can suffering be good? And I struggled with this throughout the week because even conversing with a family and my own family and my own wife, we just have to battle this mind. What is good? Why can't we just be pleasurable for doing good, right? Why can't it be that way? Well, there's an illustration that I have dug out that I would like you to listen well. There's a father and a daughter who was walking and they went to a farm 
And they saw a cocoon who's turning to butterfly. And the little daughter said to him, to, to, to dad, Dad, look at the cocoon. Look at the butterfly trying to come out. It's having a hard time. It's struggling to get out. And the dad, wanting to be a hero, reached down, ever so carefully and gently, took the bottom of the cocoon and tried to split it up. It dropped in a blob and killed the butterfly. And then he said, there's a lesson there. Somehow they need the cocoon to butterfly. They need the struggle of emergence to survive without me touching it. And that word got into me, those words, emergence to survive. Somehow, as, a, as one of your pastor, there's things that you as an adult cannot, cannot be touched by mine, cannot be decided by me. And so in your emergence to survive in life, and life itself is hard, you will choose, you will grab all, hold on to what you know is good. And sometimes your good is not the best. So there will be consequences. And even if you choose the very good, it might not be the best. And then we receive consequences. And then, when we look at our children, when we look at our young adults, they will go to a time where they will decide on their own and we cannot even put our hands anymore because they're at the age where they have the right to decide. And somehow, we want to put our fingers there. We want to be part. But there will be a time that each one of us will be facing life on our own and the emergence to survive is something that we need to hold on to because doing good is a hard thing to do. And this is where 1 Peter is taking us. In life, we will face difficulties. In life, there will be blaming game on someone. If you did this, this will not be happening. If the circumstances in life, we want to we wanna blame because of the way we have brought up. We want to blame the culture. If the culture is not so much of this, then I will not be like this. But there will be a time that each one of us will stand and we will not be ruled by blaming, by circumstances, or by culture, but we will stand in front of God and we will say, God, I choose you to be good. That's a hard thing to do. And this morning, I'd like to take you this, to this idea that we should be holding on to this. I wrote down something for you. And I'd like you to hear me out very well. Let's not grow old in church and never grow up in our faith. Let's not grow old but miss what it is to grow up in our relationship with Jesus Christ and with each other. Because today, we will hear preachers that whenever you hear that Christianity, it's all about blessing, it's all about good things, and I am all for that. God is a good God all the time. I'm into that. I'm not getting that out of you. But let me just take you to people, because if it's all blessing and it's all good, then God, and I would like to be careful with this, has been unfair to all the greatest prophets and apostles in the past. Let me give them to you. Noah in all his days of being faithful with, to God. No one believed him but his family. 120 years, 
No one believed him. No one listened to him. That's suffering for doing good. Moses, in his 40 years of not knowing what to do, and then when he found out what God wants him to do, it was 40 years of suffering. And by the way, when he was suffering because of the callousness and hard-headedness of God's people, he was only at the point where he saw the promised land, never entered the promised land. Suffering for doing good. David, he was promised to be king, but the king during his time wants him dead. Paul, in all of his messages, in all of his time, he was stoned, he was beat up, he was in prison, he died, and he was beheaded, according to church history. Now tell me, if that is not suffering for good, Peter, which is our author this morning, is telling us that all Christians go through suffering and the struggle that they go to is their emergence to survive. By the way, Peter died crucified and then hanged upside down. And that's why you can see the sign of peace that we have today. That was from Peter's death. So, suffering for doing good. Are you ready? Peter goes this way. First point, our story of transformation is through suffering. You think your life is changing? Listen to 1 Peter. Finally, all of you, be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another to, to be, uh, love one another, be compassionate and humble. If that's you, say Amen. See? Someone dropped the umbrella. <laughs> it's a hard thing. And then it goes harder. Do not repay evil with evil. If someone cuts you off bed, don't cut him back. Or insult with insult. If someone gives you a bad text, say, bless you. That's not my words. It's this order. On the contrary, repay evil with? I don't want to read that. You read it. That's not mine. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Is it possible that we are not inheriting blessing because we are repaying evil with evil? And insult with insult. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and His ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord it's against those who do evil. What's your story? Can you be saying amen to Peter with despite of what's happening in your life, God is still transforming you, yet you are suffering because it's a hard road to take, but you're in that road anyway. What is it to do this? Not to repay evil and insult, but repay it with blessing. You know, there's a movie by Whoopi Goldberg. That word, I think she's just cursing them. When these goons were about to go, Whoopi Goldberg was about to curse them, but the nun beside her said, Sister, bless you. That's what she said. You know, somehow, it's funny, but that's a word that we could use, but that's an action word to bless people. It's an action word of doing good despite of them saying something, despite of them doing something. So when I tell you this morning from the passage, as it is, 
Repay evil and insult with blessing. Amen? And I understand. You know, for those of you who said amen loud, somehow there's those of us who are saying, yeah, right. But when you look at the passage, it's not if. It's not if you can. It says, do not. Do you have a transformation story? That you could actually say, this is one of my struggle, but I'm into that struggle. Somehow we need to be shaking. There's something that needs to change in us. The way we talk back to people. The way we really deal with people. Because if you really, this is Peter, because Jesus said, love your enemies. That's even harder. Peter is just saying evil or insult. But I'd like you to look at verse 10. Keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. You go to James, and James will tell you that this tongue can start a forest fire. It ruins people's credibility and sometimes humanity. Can you bless those people? Someone said, we cannot be worshiping God and treat others like garbage. Evil to do, evil to good. I, I sometimes wonder how it is to pursue peace. That's holding on my own ego. That's holding on to my, I think I am right. I'd like you to look at verse 12 so we could move on fast. It says, eyes and ears of the Lord attentive to someone who is kneeling down or who is praying. But look at what it says when it is against evil. The whole face. I always thought of that. When you're praying, God is looking and listening. But when you're sinning, He was going. Do you get that? You know, my two children grew up with this evil look. There's a certain movement that I do with my hands and my eyebrow that they know they're in trouble growing up. It's like this. And I haven't said anything. They know they're in trouble. The looks. But I always thought, I look upwards and say, God, how is that when you're looking at me when I'm doing something wrong? And I'm repaying evil for evil. When I'm insulting people because they have insulted me. When I texted back of all the things that... Uh, and then God says, Sacrifices. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? I'd like you to answer that. Who? Imagine, if someone tells you something bad and then you said, you want to eat? You know, it would really get them off, right? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Can you please remember that? When you do something good, it's not for the people you're doing it with. It's for you. How come we always are so concerned, I'm going to do you good if you do me good? Well, they won't do you good. They will hurl insults to you. And then you will say, God, I will not fight back. And then you will be blessed. That's the order. We think if we fight back, Lord, punish. We think that's the blessing. Well, it doesn't say that. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere 
Christ as Lord. You need to underline that in your Bible as well. Always be prepared. It did not say you should prepare. It says prepare. So when you're about to feel that you're going to be insulted, that you're going to suffer for good, you better be prepared that you're not egoistic, that it's not about you. To answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Come on, it's already so unfair and now you want us to be gentle and respectful. Are you getting this? And this is, if you think you are sacrificing too much for Christianity, okay, then live during Peter's time because the suffering they got, they really were crucified, literally. If you think you're having a hard time today, no, you're not. Because the Christians before, they were being burned alive and skinned alive. We're not. The only suffering we're having right now is, Sintunado ka. I don't have a car. It's cold. Let's move on. I don't want to. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior, when you take note, your good behavior is not what you think. It's in Christ. You need to take note of that. Because sometimes we think we're being good, but it's really not godly. Being godly is in Christ. In Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Do I really need to explain that? I think Peter said it well. Suffer for what is right and be blessed. Revere Christ as Lord. Get to this clear conscience and good behavior in Christ. Help us, Lord. This is just difficult. For it is better. If it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ, thank you, Lord. If you're no longer thankful because he died for you, then you're missing something. The righteous for the unrighteous. To bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And I want you to grab hold on that because we try to do it in our strength. And then it's saying, it's the spirit of God. It's not by power, by the spirit of the Lord. You need to go there. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. I underline that because do not go too much to that, okay? I actually want to highlight that, but I won't. Um, if you want to talk about it, we'll talk about it. But the book, not book, that movie Noah by Russell Crowe, they got a very good imagination what that is, but it did not say it there. The imprisoned spirit was answered by verse 20. We stay there because it's written there. To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. 120, 120 years, God was patient. Every day Noah was telling them, there will be a flood, it's coming. There will be a flood, it's coming. 120 years. How hard-headed can those people be? But that's their time. I wonder if in our time, in 10 years, we've quitted because someone said something. In it, only a few people. Eight, eight in 20 years. Can you imagine if that's your church planting? It's only your wife and your children who said, yeah, God is good. We're saved through water. And this water symbolizes 
baptism that now saves you also. You see the gear, it's changing from first to fifth because it's saying this water symbolizes baptism. That's from Noah to our time. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. Pledge. I always talk of that. How do you do that? Like pledge of allegiance? No, it's not. I think the Filipinos, being biased as a Filipino, there's a team that is called KKK. It's not Ku Klux Klan. They stole it. KKK is the rebellious Filipino group against the Spaniards. And they only have a machete to defend themselves. And the Spanish during that time, they have so much money, so they will pay people who were rebelling so that they will be told who's leading this so that they can kill them. So what did, God, what did this guy do? Took a machete, started a group called KKK, and he said, if you're really for the country and for this revolution, you will sign your name by using your blood. And then they cut themselves, and then they sign. And I always thought, What saves me from the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the blood of Jesus Christ. If that's not good enough for you today, I don't know what will be. But verse 22, and we end, who has gone into heaven, he's there, and he's at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Now you can say, Amen. So when you're stepping through this kind of suffering that you are going through, do not forget that there's a God who is still in control, who is still sovereign, and He's still here today. The end of suffering is not the absence of suffering. It is the presence of God in you. And I will end with this. To my high school, college, and university children, when you speak the truth, when you talk about Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life, and us adults, when we talk that way, because it's a changing time, you will be ridiculed, you will be opposed, and sometimes violently. Somehow there will be a time that they will accept this truth. Every knee will bow. Because it will be self-evident. Remember this. Truth does not need you to defend itself. It has a defender. And it's a liar. And his name, Jesus. So, let me conclude. Suffering for doing good. According to 1 Peter 3, 8-22. God in it, God in us. Amen? Amen. 